Is Mars Dead or Alive? by Waldemar Kampfert. The Forum, August 1924. This month, Mars is as close to the Earth as it can come, and astronomers are again speculating on the famous canals. It is hard to resist the belief that they were constructed by intelligent beings, who used them to transport the extremely meager water supply of their planet. As far as we can infer, a Martian, if he exists, is three times as tall as an inhabitant of the Earth, only one-third as heavy, and 81 times more effective. But his race is nearly run, for he lives, terror-stricken, upon a senile planet. Turn the telescope upon Mars, and what is it that greets the eye and arouses a sense of cosmic companionship? A globe with a diameter of 4,230 miles, only slightly more than half that of the Earth. A globe with white polar caps that disappear and reappear with seasonal regularity. A globe which changes in hue from ochreous red to bluish green and back again, as spring, summer, autumn, and winter come and go. Above all, a globe wondrously cobwebbed at certain seasons with lines, the so-called canals, so startlingly artificial that they arrest the attention. To seek in these features and in these seasonal phenomena evidences of intelligent life seems, at first blush, as difficult as to discover the existence of sand fleas in the desert of Sahara from the top of some distant mountain. Yet there is good reason to conclude that the surface of Mars has been molded not only by nature, but also by intelligence. For by assuming that intelligence has applied itself, can the highly artificial canals be satisfactorily explained. To the late Professor Percival Lowell and the late Professor William H. Pickering, we owe the most minute and accurate studies of this Martian surface that have ever been made, and to Professor Lowell the highly ingenious and plausible arguments on which a belief in a wonderfully endowed race of Martians must be based. Life as we know it must be defined in terrestrial terms. It is the resultant of many circumstances, some purely astronomical, some physical, some chemical. That Mars fulfills the astronomical and physical requirements all astronomers are now agreed. Thus, its orbit, while not so circular as that of the Earth, assures a supply of solar energy sufficiently constant in quantity and quality so that the planetary surface is not subjected for long periods to unendurable extremes of heat and cold. Its inclination to its orbit and its day, almost exactly as long as ours, are such that the whole surface is alternately warmed and cooled at frequent intervals. Lastly, it has mass enough to hold at least a tenuous atmosphere. When we examine the chemical conditions, we stand upon somewhat less certain ground. If there is life, there must be air, and there must be water. If these are absent, the whole theory that Mars is peopled by a race of superbeings must collapse. It so happens that the seasonal phenomena testify eloquently to the presence of both air and water, and that this evidence is fortified by the spectroscope. Not even the most carping astronomical critic of Lowell will deny that Mars has an atmosphere composed of gases similar to those in which the Earth is cloaked. Nor will the most sanguine believer in a race of Martians deny that this atmosphere is so thin and so rare that we of this world cannot breathe it and live. Hence, the barometric pressure is so low that water boils on Mars at a temperature of 115 degrees Fahrenheit, instead of the terrestrial 212 degrees. If Mars were as warm as the Earth, water would boil when exposed to the sun. Strange sporadic yellow clouds have been observed. They unmistakably point to atmospheric currents. Mists, too, have been seen at the poles. Despite clouds and mists, weather prognostications are hardly necessary. Day after day, the sun beats down pitilessly. Night after night, the stars gleam persistently in the cold, inky sky of the tropics. Yet this rarity of the air, this absence of tempests, is no proof that life cannot exist. Animals and plants are found on some of our highest mountains, where the air is not much denser than it is on Mars. Those who oppose Lowell argue that because Mars is not protected by an atmospheric blanket as thick as that of our Earth, its surface temperature must be hotter than any known form of life can bear during the day, and several hundred degrees below zero during the bitter night. But Lowell's application of physical laws, coupled with what the observers agree occurs on the surface, indicates that Mars must have a mean temperature of about 48 degrees Fahrenheit. That of the Earth is about 61 degrees. There are no billowing oceans on Mars, no vast inland lakes, no stupendous waterfalls, no Amazons and Mississippis. The planet is a huge desert with no elevation higher than two or three thousand feet. Its pitiful supply of water is collected at the poles. 
Lowell has estimated that the Earth has 189,000 times more than Mars's pittance. Pickering has calculated that if 20 feet of snow fall over a polar area, an ocean 2,000 miles in diameter and only 2 feet deep would be formed in 4 of our months during the process of melting. This would be about the amount of water contained in one of our Great Lakes. Imagine Europe, North and South America, Asia, and Africa reduced to this tragic pass for water. We would hoard every drop of it. We would sink our international disputes, our political jealousies and rivalries in solving the one all-absorbing economic problem of slaking our thirst, of growing vegetation for ourselves and our animals, of enlisting every technical aid to transport the water yielded by the melting Arctic and Antarctic snows to those regions of our temperate and torrid zones, which, if properly irrigated, would still be fertile. If Mars is inhabited, its people must long ago have formed an international organization to dig trenches over the whole planet in the struggle for life. What the annual inundation of the Nile was to the Egyptians for centuries, the unlocking of the polar snows must be to these hypothetical Martians. Lowell was not a romantically inclined amateur scientist, but a specialist in astronomy. He devoted his life and his fortune to a study of Mars in an observatory built at Flagstaff, Arizona, in an almost ideal atmosphere. His observations have been confirmed for the most part by astronomers who have examined Mars under equally favorable conditions. His daring conclusion that Mars is alive and that in the changing hue of the planets and in the seasonal appearance and disappearance of the canals, we have the evidence of intelligence, while not generally accepted, deserves respectful consideration because it explains convincingly and simply what actually occurs. Suppose that we adopt Lowell's startling conviction. What manner of beings are these Martian canal diggers? We can make a few deductions from the mere size of the planet, for important consequences follow from the relatively small mass of Mars, one-ninth that of the Earth. The attraction of gravitation must be less than it is on the larger Earth. What we call a ton would weigh but a third as much on Mars. Paradoxical as it may seem, the smaller the planet, the larger and more agile must be its people, and the taller its grasses and trees. A Martian weighs only a third as much as he would on the Earth. If he is manlike, he must be three times as tall, three times as bulky, and correspondingly more efficient than any terrestrial Samson. Because of his greater stature and bulk, he must have muscles 27 times as effective as those of a Samson under similar gravitational conditions. But since he is on Mars, where three earthly pounds weigh but one pound, he is actually 81 times more effective. To this supposed Martian, our game of tennis must seem an amiable form of ping pong. He can drive a tennis ball two and one half times as far as an earthly champion. If he is a coal heaver, he can pick up several hundred weight and toy with it. He can do the work of 50 or 60 terrestrial laborers, and throw canal dirt in quantities that would compare favorably with those scooped by a Panama steam shovel. Not only is he strong, if he is like a man, but vastly more intelligent. Evolution surely sways Martian as well as terrestrial life. Mars being physically older than the Earth, it must have developed a high type of intelligence long before the dinosaurs became extinct, or man made his appearance. Probably our civilization is but a crude manifestation from the Martian standpoint. We must be even more primitive than cavemen compared with the engineers who dug Lowell's canals. In truth, we are several million years behind the Martian times. The people of Mars may well have invented, years ago, mechanical contrivances, among them excavators, compared with which ours seem ridiculously crude and inefficient. To deduce the actual physical appearance of a Martian would be a matter of much bootless speculation. It is not even necessary that he should resemble man. We know too little about the chemical conditions that prevail on Mars to hazard even a guess as to the appearance of a Martian canal digger. Moreover, man happens to conform to a very definite chemical prescription, and we have no reason to suppose that precisely the same prescription has been filled on any celestial body other than the Earth. We cannot even predict what manner of creature would evolve from man if the temperature of the Earth were gradually raised or lowered through ages to come, with far-reaching changes in environment to which the human organism must adapt itself. Man is the product of a unique, possibly unstable combination of chemical factors of a whole set of circumstances so extraordinary, even in the Earth's history, that it is extremely unlikely that he finds a remotely similar counterpart on Mars. Since we know so little about the conditions under which life must maintain itself on Mars, it is hopeless to speculate what manner of creature is this that started to build canals millenniums ago, and to begin an exciting quest of water. When we consider the terrestrial ant and its ways, 
its astonishing instinctive sense of organization, discipline, and social cooperation, there is no reason why a Martian may not be a highly intelligent super ant. But whatever this imaginary Martian may be, his race is nearly run, for he lives, terror-stricken, upon a senile planet. To us, he and his desert world constitute an awful prophecy of the tragic doom that awaits the Earth and mankind.